Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to On the Bright Line podcast, tales from recovering food addicts from the perspective of a physician, a therapist, and an off-the-wall storyteller. We are not affiliated or endorsed by Bright Line Eating, and all content presented in this podcast represents our personal opinions and does not represent medical, nutritional, or psychological professional advice. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the clinical health benefits of uh, Bright Line Eating, and we're going to affectionately call this the Dr. Bonnie episode, mm-hmm. <laughs> because I think that she's going to have the most to say as she is a uh, physician. <laughs> so um, there are a few things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, yes, like there's some science behind um, why this makes sense and why mm-hmm. um, eating this way makes sense. We're going to talk about... Uh, my personal lab history. And I don't know if you want to share some other stuff, Bonnie, possibly. And then, um, also we're going to talk about intermittent fasting at the end and what that looks like. Cause that's a big, um, there's this real buzzy right now in the, in mm-hmm. the diet world is intermittent fasting and how that correlates with bright line eating and, um, what that, what, what are the benefits of that? So, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Bonnie, to kind of just, just talk through, um, you know, high level overview. Yeah. What are the clinical health benefits? Mm -hmm. So I want to actually start by talking about diabetes because Mm. this is a meal plan that has to do with sugar. And so I want to explain what diabetes is on a very high level. And then we'll kind of get into how this kind of eating affects that um, process. So there's two types of diabetes. There is type one and type two. Type one is where your pancreas doesn't make insulin. And so pancreas needs to make insulin. Insulin, I think about as the gatekeeper that opens the gate to each cell and lets sugar come in, Hmm. right? So you eat sugar, it gets into your bloodstream, and that can be all the foods that turn turn into sugar. Flour and starch, all that turns into Mm -hmm. sugar. Some of our starchy vegetables turn into sugar. Lots of our food turns into sugar, but obviously pure sugar is already right there as instant ready sugar. So when the pancreas senses that you've consumed sugar, Mm -hmm. It releases insulin. Insulin runs over to the cell, and it's like a little gate man. It opens up the gate, and it lets the sugar come in so Mm. that your cell can get the energy it needs, which is great. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, what happens is the gatekeeper's not there. Your pancreas doesn't make insulin at all, and so Mm. when you eat, all that sugar is in the bloodstream, and it's floating around in the bloodstream, and it can't get in the cell. So the cells are starving. They're hungry, but the amount of sugar building up in the bloodstream becomes itself like a poison. It Uh, becomes toxic to your organs, particularly your kidneys, mm -hmm. your retina. Um, It it wreaks havoc in all of your organ systems. It can cause cardiovascular disease, Mm -hmm. and it can cause an emergent chemical problem called diabetic ketoacidosis because the cells are starving, and you start breaking down muscle and fat to try to get Mm -hmm. the sugar they need, Mm -hmm. but then they still can't get it because when it turns into whatever, it still can't get in the cell. So type 1 diabetics tend to lose weight. They tend to be very thirsty because their body is craving water to flush out that extra sugar to get it out of the kidneys, right? And they urinate a lot because they're taking in all that extra Mm -hmm. water. And so we're not going to talk about that really, but just to help people understand that's type one, that's a different Mm -hmm. thing. Type two diabetes are, and and there's non-insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent. There's new nomenclature now, but Mm -hmm. just to keep it simple, the, the, basically the, um, the acquired type diabetes is where your pancreas is still working but you've got so much sugar floating by because of intake that it can't keep up. And what happens is that gatekeeper's running out, you're eating that Mm -hmm. sugar and it's coming out and it's opening up the gate, but it's having to do it so much, it gets a little rusty. The gate gets a little rusty if you think about it that way. So you still have too much sugar going into the cell, so you're storing fat, but you also still are building up too much sugar in the bloodstream and you're getting Mm -hmm. all those toxic effects. And unfortunately, that type of diabetes comes on very slowly and um, quietly, Mm -hmm. and so you can get kidney and um, eye damage and nerve damage before you ever even realize how bad it's gotten. Mm -hmm. Um, But for many years before you even have diabetes, you can develop Mm -hmm. this insulin resistance or this rusty gait where you're still getting inflammatory and toxic effects of the high sugar. Um, It's causing weight gain, obesity. Mm -hmm. Sugar itself causes the formation of triglycerides So when you eat fatty food, that can contribute to your cholesterol level, Mm -hmm. but your triglycerides, which also cause heart disease, are really caused by sugar intake. Mm. Lots of people that have horribly high cholesterol or triglycerides have a secondary disease where they don't clear out the normal amount 
of cholesterol, triglycerides normally. And sometimes mm -hmm. people can eat a very healthy diet and have high levels of those substances in their blood because they don't clear them. Right. But for somebody that has a normal ability to process cholesterol and triglycerides, which are essential components of your bodily functions, we need those elements there, but we need to clear them out when we're done using them. And if you eat too much sugar, you get a huge buildup of triglycerides. Triglycerides can actually cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. They can also cause pancreatitis. They can cause an inflammation of the pancreas um, that's trying to keep up with all that insulin pr production, which mm -hmm. can be fatal, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, these all kind of tie together, and the sugar intake is kind of the key component. And so when we decrease sugar intake or cut out processed sugar intake, mm -hmm. we can actually reverse hypertriglyceridemia or elevated triglycerides, and we can reverse type 2 diabetes if it's been caused just from the intake, which for most people, unfortunately, worldwide now, this is the number one cause of the type two or adult acquired diabetes mm. is just excess sugar intake. Um, I know that my own husband had <coughs> heart disease. Oh, sorry, Sprinkles is barking. Had heart, <laughs> heart disease and almost had a heart attack, had a blockage in one of his arteries. Mm -hmm. And he has a genetic problem with the triglycerides, but also, <coughs> was eating too many sugars, mm -hmm. right? And after he went on Bright Line eating, within about four months, his triglycerides came down from the high 300s to the low 100s. Wow. So, and I've seen this over and over, uh, patients that have been on diabetic medication, being able to get off the diabetic medication, mm -hmm. and a normalization of the blood sugar and a reduction of the inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I will say, in your whole body, this really high sugar content causes just a lot of inflammation. And so you'll hear people in Bright Line Eating talk about how they had joint pain, mm -hmm. literally joint inflammation, joint yeah. pain, as well as heart disease, as well as just like feeling terrible. Yeah. And when you cut out the sugar, those things go away. And the reason mm -hmm. is because you're removing the agent that's triggering the inflammation. Right. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I think um, maybe just another question, um, because some people may, may not have heard, uh, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson talk mm -hmm. about the dopamine receptors and mm -hmm. all that in mm -hmm. the brain. Do you want to talk about what sugar does to your sure. brain mm -hmm. as well? So, and, and I'll caveat this with, uh, Dr. Thompson, Susan, um, is a, um, PhD in brain neuroscience, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So she's, so she, she's done studying of, you know, effects of, you know, sugar effects on brain and, and that sort of thing. So, um, I, you know, not, I'm not, we're, we're definitely not giving any kind of medical advice here. Um, yeah. you know, we're just, we're just talking about the science as we know it. So, yeah. So I think, you know, the reality is, and again, she goes into this in great depth, which I found really, uh, helpful when mm -hmm. I was first beginning to get on this program, but basically sugar acts like a drug. Mm -hmm. It hits your dopamine receptors. It gives you an immediate feeling of good. And then that effect starts to wear off. And then you need a little more to get that feeling. Just mm -hmm. like with alcohol, just like with drugs, mm -hmm. your receptors, your dopamine receptors upregulate after they get hit with this sugar load. Mm -hmm. And they upregulate to need a little more to get the hit because they're trying right. to rebalance themselves. And so, you know, the longer you're eating a high sugar diet, um, if you have the propensity to addiction to sugar, um, you know, the higher and higher levels of sugar it's going to take just to get that little bit of dopamine. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think, you know, like, uh, I guess I will share, uh, my personal experience with my clinical labs from, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and I, I said, I've talked about this a little bit before in an earlier episode about where I started and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of, maybe I'm not super unusual, but I'm a little unusual in that, uh, the, my lab values were my, um, catalyst to start BLE. So mm -hmm. I have lab values from the very, like literally three days before I started eating mm -hmm. BLE or not even, um, and, you know, and I've had them in three month increments throughout the program. So, uh, you know, we could talk about that a little bit that, um, the things, you know, the things that got me scared straight, um, onto BLE was I was already, um, type two diabetic. And so I had, uh, man, I had managed my blood sugar pretty well with medication, um, but it had creeped up to 9.6. So, um, Bonnie said before yeah. that mm -hmm. six, you know, six is normal and it should be below that. Um, so it had crept up to 9.6. That was the high, the high that I'd ever seen. So that was, you know, end of November, right before I started BLE. Mm -hmm. Uh, my total cholesterol was almost 300. It was like 297. 
and it should be 200 or under. Mm -hmm. And then my triglycerides were 694, which was really scary, as Bonnie just said, mm -hmm. um, because that can cause all kinds of problems. They should be, what, one, 150 or lower. 150 mm -hmm. or lower. So that was, the, you know, beginning state. Like, that, yeah. was, that was the beginning state for me. So after three months of BLE and doing the program and, you know, not breaking my lines, I, my A1C was down to 6.6. .6, so I had lowered it by wow. three, yeah, three Which points. Which is amazing. Yeah, three points in three months. Uh, actually, no, I think it was 6.3. It doesn't matter. And it let was, me just interject yeah. that a lot of the drug companies that sell drugs to lower sugar brag when they can get your A1C down one or two points. Yeah. So the fact that you were able to bring your A1C wow. down three points in just a few months, right. just from a change in diet, is spectacular. And it really speaks to the reality that we're basically giving ourselves a drug, yeah. right. and then we're following it with a drug to counter right. counteract right. the effects of the drug, which is right. nuts. Well, and I guess I should say, I'll back up and also say, I was taking a drug for, um, for diabetes, I was taking metformin. Mm -hmm. So I was taking a mm -hmm. thousand milligrams of metformin daily. And it, and I knew that was at the very beginning. And I knew walking into my appointment with my doctor that I went to see when I got those original labs taken that she was going to want to up it. And I, and I begged mm -hmm. her and put she, you on insulin. Well, she didn't want to put me on insulin. She did want to up my yeah. metformin, but, and right. I, and I begged her to let me try, let me try this. I said, let mm -hmm. me try BLE. Let me see if I can get it under control. So all that to say, I was still taking at the time of that, those three months labs, I was still taking a thousand of the metformin. So mm -hmm. I was taking a thousand of metformin, lowered my A1C by three points, a little over, I think. Um, my triglycerides came down to 106. Whoa. And my total cholesterol, I think, was like in the 140s or something like that, but I started a statin because mm -hmm. she, the doctor, really wanted me on a statin, and I was taking a little bit of a statin, which was fine. So I, I wanted to caveat all that, that, that right. this I was taking, I was also taking a little bit of a blood pressure medication at that point because my blood pressure was elevated. So that was the three month mark. Mm. At the six month mark, oh, after, and after that, after that reduction in A1C, um, I asked the doctor if I could come down to 500 of my metformin. Mm -hmm. And then we, I think we went down to 500 of metformin at that point. So halved my diabetes medication. Um, after my cholesterol came down the way it did, I also convinced her to take me off the statin, which she was like, well, you're just going to come back up. And I was mm -hmm. like, uh, that's, I was like, let's see, like, let's, right. let's run the experiment. Right, yeah. We talked about this in previous episodes. Like, let's run the experiment and see, you know, three months of not being on a statin. If my cholesterol rebounds a little is not going to, you know, it's not going to kill me at this point. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, um, so anyway, so that was the three month mark. So at the six month mark, I, my A1C came down to 5.5, which is now normal. I mean, in, Way normal, normal. Mm -hmm. in the normal range, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's still on 500 of the metformin. My total cholesterol came up a little bit. It was like 179 or something like that. So still normal on no medication whatsoever. <laughs> and my triglycerides remained the same at 106. And at that point, I was getting lightheaded on hikes and I felt like it was because of my blood pressure medication. And I also yeah. asked to come off my blood pressure right. medication. So I am now only to, from coming from taking all of that, you know, all of that medication, I'm now taking half of the uh, diabetes, you know, the metformin that I was at the beginning. And the only mm -hmm. reason why I'm only doing that is because I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this time my A1C, I'm, I'm coming up on the nine month mark. I'm hoping this time my A1C will be even lower and then I can feel like I can just drop it yeah. all together. So I've been able to, you know, not only release a bunch of weight, but also totally reverse these, you know, really scary, potentially life ending, life altering labs that I had. And it's not even quite been, I'm like right up on the nine month mark. I'm going to have my labs done again in a couple weeks. So awesome. So. And you know, I had so many patients in my practice that were diabetic and had been diabetic for years. And yeah, you just see them on all these many, they're taking two medications for the mm -hmm. diabetes and a blood pressure medication and a statin and a, and it's just like, just to physically have to swallow all those pills every day. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, they work to help prevent the, the consequences, but they don't fully. And mm -hmm. so then they're still living with loss of sensation in their feet, diabetic, you know, neuropathy, neuropathy, neuropathy. Yeah. Um, visual changes, diabetic retinopathy, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, potentially kidney injury, you know, diabetic nephropathy. So all mm -hmm. these organ damages that happen. And once the organs are damaged, 
You're only preventing worsening of the damage. You yeah. can't reverse yeah. any of those apathies, right? They, you just, your goal then is just to give the patient more and more medication to keep their A1C as in control as you can to prevent those mm -hmm. things from getting worse. And so, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of insane really to think that we're just shoving the sugar in, then we're causing all these problems, mm -hmm. and then we're taking a bunch of medication to reverse it or to stabilize it. And it always, always, I used to give an example to my patients, like, you know, if you bought an exotic pet at the pet store, mm -hmm. you'd buy one of those little books that talks about what that pet needs to be healthy mm -hmm. and happy, right? And, and that's the food you would feed that animal. You wouldn't start giving it donuts and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but that's, but that's what we do to ourselves. We are, you know, we are an organism that needs a certain type of nutrition and that's not the food that any of us are getting. And we can probably get into it in a later episode that we do, but you know, the packaged food industry has worked really hard and very deliberately mm -hmm. to get people addicted to well, packaged products. And that's sugar. what I was going to say yeah. is I was like, we're also talking about an addictive stuff, literally an addictive sub mm -hmm. substance that we, and so like, I think for me, especially I had to release any shame <laughs> oh, that yeah. I felt about like, oh, I've done this to myself or I'm such oh, a horrible, right. you know, oh, I'm absolutely. such a horrible person right. because I can't even like take care of my own body, right? right? And I have two little kids. I mean, mm -hmm. good grief, you know? So I think I had to release a lot of the shame and then I think that's what the science that, um, you know, Susan describes in the book is about, is about how addictive these substances are mm -hmm. and the refinement of the sugar and the refinement of the flour really just you know, it is, it even, you know, even someone who doesn't have food addiction tendencies as I do, it's still an addictive substance. And it's been mm -hmm. carefully curated deliberately to create the addiction, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a physician. I know mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to be eating. I know what my, I want my patients to be eating, right? And yet I still wasn't able to control that eating. Yeah. And so there should be no guilt or shame about it. It's like, you know, if you gave a toddler cocaine mm -hmm. and the toddler got addicted to cocaine, right. we really wouldn't blame the toddler, you know, right. but we've been right. fed these foods since our early childhood yes. and we became addicted to them because that's the nature of the human brain, right. you know? And so, well, and I think also our, our society, the culture of, well, but you can take a pill for that. Oh yeah. Right. I keep, mean, do, keep doing what you, what you want to do. Keep yeah. doing what feels good. And we'll just, we'll just make the magic pill. There is a drug out now called Ozempic. Mm -hmm. It's an injection. And what it does is it actually mimics another disorder that's caused by diabetes that we haven't mentioned, which is delayed gastric emptying, emptying or gastroparesis. So mm -hmm. the nerves of the stomach can become so injured from the diabetes that the stomach stops contracting in the normal way that it needs to, to mm -hmm. empty its food. Mm -hmm. And that also becomes a permanent disability. Ozempic mm -hmm. is a drug that causes a side effect of giving you delayed gastric emptying. So it makes you feel full really oh. quick. Which you know, I mean, and the reality I is, no idea I, that yeah. If you look at did. if you look at the if you look at the results, it's very successful. And if you look at the results of that compared to any other diet pills we've had, like right. stimulants, right? Yeah. yeah, it has those aren't as successful. So you know, if you've got a patient that's going to die from complications of obesity, and this this injection is going to help fix that, mm -hmm. I mean, I get it why people are doing that. Sure. Do what you you know, people are like do whatever they need to do, right? Just right. like gastric surgery. You know, right. the gastric sleeve or the bariatric surgery. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. we're at a point of desperation. We have people dying of obesity. Right. It's like if you had cancer, you'd do an experimental treatment if there was nothing left. I right. totally right. understand. But the reality is this Ozempic only works while you're using it. Right. You know? So if you stop using it, you regain all your weight. Right. Because right. it's not helping you change the food Behavior. addiction. Right. Habits, um, it's yeah. not helping you change the choices of what food you're picking. Right. And all of the psychological things that we've discussed about how we all get to the point we get to with, with food addiction. Sure. It just helps you feel full faster, right. you know? And, and I cannot imagine needing to take something like for the rest of my life, just, you know, right. Just for that. But I totally mm -hmm. understand if people aren't, I mean, if you don't know about bright line eating or right. you don't understand mm -hmm. how this food addiction works, you're just being told you're being ashamed. You're being shamed right. by people. You just right. need to control your eating. Right. This is your fault because you don't have the so, willpower, right? So right. let's also talk about, the healthcare industry in general and the way yeah. physicians are taught yes. to treat. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and because and I wasn't Susan trained. Susan did a vlog yeah. about this, which is yeah. actually, it, it actually, I, it enraged me. Like, and yeah. I agree with her. There was no, yeah. I wasn't it, like, it wasn't like I was anti what she was saying. Like I completely agree with her. It enrages mm -hmm. me because physicians are taught, you know, go ahead, Bonnie. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, we mm -hmm. were just taught in medical school, you know, it's about calorie counting right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, carb control. But then mm -hmm. also that 
there is a, there is a, I think, and this is what Susan's vlog was about is like, there is a general, um, feeling amongst the metal community that people who are obese are lazy and like, yeah. it's, a, it's not that there's no talk about any of this science that we're talking yeah. about. It's that there is a general laziness of people who are obese and yeah. they just need to, they just need to right. get up and do the thing. Yeah. Kind of like, well, I, I have the formula for the kinds of food you should be eating. Mm -hmm. And if you're right. not willing to stick to that formula, you're just being non-compliant. Right. Right? right. Exactly. And, and, and because we weren't taught in medical school about Food addiction. food addiction <laughs> and food addiction is still kind of a very tentative subject in the medical community yes. because they're like, well, food is what you eat. You can't be addicted to right. food. You know, that's, that's just made up by people that are, you know, in the diet industry or whatever. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a problem because we weren't trained to, I mean, I think I just kind of cringe now when I think back at, I did help people lose weight. Mm -hmm. I recommended a low carb diet. I didn't recommend no sugar right. at all. Um, but I think I got some people to a better place just by having sure. them have a drastic cut in sure. sugars, but I didn't really help them address you know, the psychological addiction part. And mm -hmm. I didn't understand it for myself. I was still struggling with it myself. And, right. and yeah. you know, most physicians are just human beings and they are uh, having some of the same struggles. I mean, do, do as, do as I say, not as I do. Right. But, yeah. but also or like if you're a physician's overweight, shame, if right. you're a physician's overweight right. and you sure. go to that physician and you talk to them about, I think I'm going to try this bright line eating thing. Right. right. And they're just going to be like, you know, why? Because as a human, they're like, Oh, that sounds like something I couldn't do. Right. So therefore it has to not work. Or right. Like because I don't want to do it. Who is a, you know, who probably has never struggled with food addiction in her entire life, which is totally fine. And she's a wonderful person and been a great mm -hmm. doctor to me. I'm not criticizing my physician, but I think, you know, I recommended the book to her. She actually has another patient that lost a mega amount of weight on BLE and she oh, still wow. hasn't read it. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, let's not be avoidant. Like if yeah. this is working and you see this working and you see my I yeah. mean, clinical results, like yeah. I could be, I could be a clinical study mm -hmm. as to how well this works right. for people who are having, you know, who are type two diabetic and having, you know, Hypertension, high yeah. yeah, all this stuff because of obesity, because of obesity, yeah. because of what I was eating, because yeah. of my body. Like, why are we not addressing this? I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting really impressed. Right. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> right. And I think it's just because we don't have the knowledge. The physicians don't have that knowledge. Well, and they're just not trained. They're not trained that way. No. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not how they think. And I think it's that struggle to believe that people could be willing to stick with this, right? Because when I talk to people about BLE and that as an option, right, just, just like, you know, you guys show, well, you know, Ooh, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, you know, I could never that, do that. I could never do right? that. That's what right? I said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Too restrictive. Not going to be able to do it. <laughs> right. And I, I think there's a struggle to believe that it, it not only it is doable, but that it has the well, impact. We, that and we've heard does. of so many other, I mean, I've been on every so diet, you know, there's right the now. cabbage diet and the grapefruit diet right. and the juicing. The, Juicing. Juicing. I did, I did right. that. Right. And it's like, and those are all extreme and they didn't work yeah. because right. they didn't address the you know, addiction. And so just, right. just telling someone you're going to cut out all sugar and flour, it just sounds to anyone listening, like this is just another fad thing that you're doing. That's right. very extreme. But do you think that that again, kind of speaks to that diet culture view that, you know, yes. uh, back, back in the day it was, well, you did a diet for a little while air quotes. Until you got right? to the weight, you, got you, wanted. To the weight right. you wanted. And then there was that idea. Well, you know, now I've gotten to my weight and I can do whatever I want. And that's that whole yo-yo yeah. dieting and that, that the difference of believing this is just the way I'm going to eat for the rest of my life. Right. And that that's a good thing. And that, I that think is not a punishment. Yeah. And I think about it now, like I said, using the pet analogy, really like, yeah, I'm eating the food my body is designed to eat. It's yeah. so obvious to me now. It's so right. like, yeah. duh. Right. Like, oh. Of course, our bodies were meant to eat a ton. As, as I melt away. You know, yeah. right. <laughs> our, you know, our bodies were meant to consume some protein, some fruit, and a ton of vegetables, yeah. and a tiny amount of grain. Right. And that's the natural... Right. I mean, if you were well, going to, like, like, let's take that a step further. Like, let's talk about whole foods. Like we were really meant to consume whole foods. We were right. meant to consume ultra processed right. foods. Right. Like that was not like what we were designed to right. eat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we were meant to eat the food out of the ground or, you know, off yeah. of the animals. Mm -hmm. so. It's only really been for the last 80 years or so sure. that these foods have been available. And I mean, when you look at the length of exist, you know, human existence and you look at the development of processed packaged foods yeah. and the development of obesity worldwide. Right. It's a direct correlation. Direct I mean, correlation. it's just 
we just decided to stop consuming real food and right. begin consuming chemicals and refined right. sugars. Well, right. And, you and know, there's it's this just... meme going around. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but there's a meme going around on social social media that's like, why are, why are we so convinced in our culture that eating real food is dieting? Like, it says something to uh, that yeah, right. effect. Like, it's like, right. n- now, in, if you decide to eat real, real whole foods, mm-hmm. it's considered dieting. Like, why, how have we gotten to that place mm-hmm. where, yeah. you know, ultra processed foods is Because normal. we're all addicted to those yummy sugary treats. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if we all are doing it. That's what Susan and, calls And them Robin can talk about the psychological part mm-hmm. of this. But if you're, let's just take cocaine for an example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I do, if I'm using cocaine. And I know, obviously, cocaine's not good for me, and I know it's not legal. I mean, I know it's right. really bad, right? But right. if everybody I hang out with is doing cocaine, then yeah. when I'm with them, it's like we're having a good time, and it feels normal. Right. Yep. Right? And I think that's the thing is we are all in this world, not even just this country now, mm-hmm. eating these processed foods. So everybody's doing it, so it's normal. Right. So right. if you're doing whole foods and you're refusing to eat packaged foods, you're the one that's abnormal, and this is where we're at now. But I think some of that, again, goes back to our society and the way we have evolved to living our lives, right? We've got kids, and each kid is in a sport and art and a play and this. And I have so many people say to me, well, but I don't have time to cook because I have to get the kids here, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. And it's it's that struggle to say, so what, what is this life that you really want to be living, and can we make and an awareness of that these choices that we are doing are are what becomes our downfall and that we as a society perhaps have to stop pushing this lifestyle right and i think back in the day it was the convenience right i can remember getting the first our first microwave cuz <laughs> cuz i'm that old right <laughs> but i can remember being like oh my gosh you know like we can make food really fast yeah. now mm-hmm. and that was a status symbol yeah. Right. And that eating out is a status yeah. symbol. Yeah. And so it's how are we as a culture, as a society going to be, are we going to be willing to take a step back from fast food, fast eating, you know, convenience, convenience yeah. um, and really get back to what is actually going to lead to longevity, health, well-being. Well, I think it's like also how do we get the food industry on board with changing the convenience food? You don't. Food? You don't. You probably don't. I yeah, agree with because you. the food industry but is all saying, packaged food. Soda. Yep. I mean, when yep. they figured out. It's all. I mean, I, I'm reading a book called, uh, I think it's called Sugar Fat and something. Mm-hmm. Um, sugar fat and something. Sugar fat mm-hmm. and something. Right. Um, right. Like sugar fat and salt, that. I think is what it's called. Let me Google mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That. And anyway, mm-hmm. they're basically talking about how for the last, again, 80 years, the, the, the big food companies have been um, studying all the foods with sugar in them to find what they would call the bliss point. So they literally had labs, have oh, labs. Wow. Salt, Sugar, Fat by Michael Moss. Thank you. Okay. Excellent book. It's Number it'll, one New York Times. It will summer. enrage you. It will absolutely oh, wow. enrage you. <laughs> and they basically have labs where they bring in people, including children, mm. right? They were testing pudding and they brought in children and they give them a scoop of pudding right. and have them like rate it and they just keep eating the pudding till they and they keep increasing oh, the sugar oh till they hit a point where even more sugar didn't make it better and then that's called the bliss point and they've done that with oh, soda and every packaged food um they've done it with pasta sauce you know what they added in mm-hmm. sugar to make it taste mm-hmm. better and they found the bliss point all these packaged foods mm-hmm. have been engineered to find the chemical bliss point at which you don't want to stop eating or drinking that wow. food. And so, and again, if you just get back to how we're human beings that are meant to eat whole foods, that's mm-hmm. just all kinds of wrong. Right. And sure. And, and the packaged food industry, they've done things to address health by making the low fat or the low sugar, right. just as a gimmick though. In the end, sure. in the end, you don't need a food industry if you're just right. getting fresh fruits and vegetables yeah. and right. meats. Yeah. I mean, right. there's no food industry. There's a grocery store. You need the grocery right. store right. and you need a farmer Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah, and a rancher. Uh, and a rancher. Mm-hmm. You yeah. need those people, but we don't need, you know, and I won't name them because I'm right. not, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. But we don't need the big package We're food not companies. Looking to enrage anybody. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, maybe we need a company that that freezes fresh fruits and vegetables so that you can have them. You know, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying like mm-hmm. culturally, if there was a cultural shift, I mean, I guess like you know, there's my pie in the sky mm-hmm. ideal yeah. idealist self, but like if there's a cultural shift, then then those food the the now hyper processed foods 
could then turn into how do we how do we convenience Whole Foods? Like, yeah. how do we make mm-hmm. that convenient? Like, I mean, like, and that gets you know, down to improving food deserts and things like yeah, that. Sure. How we how we fix that is we sure. make that get accessible. more grocery stores with fresh fruits and vegetables sure. into yep. more corners of the world, right? right? Yeah. Well, and it's not like you have to pay an arm and a leg to get you know already like already peeled, you know, carrots or whatever, right, right. like whatever the case right. might be, you know, like the things that like, yes, like you're saying, like you're, mm-hmm. you know, people are like, I don't want to take the time mm-hmm. to do X, Y, and Z to prep that thing. I will eat it if it was easy and convenient. So like, how do we make it more easy and convenient? Right. But again, you know, I, that's, this is a whole nother topic. For a whole, sure. Well, not a whole nother topic, but just yeah. like a whole, you yeah. know, industry shift that we're, it's, yeah. we're not going to make happen. And yeah. you know, our little, corner of the world but Mm -hmm. uh i think the i think the last thing that we wanted to address in this episode was to talk about how um ble uh coincides with intermittent fasting and what that Mm -hmm. what that clinically why why that clinically is important so intermittent fasting is the idea that you have a period of time where you don't eat and the reason is you're resting your pancreas and Mm -hmm. as i mentioned when you eat Mm -hmm. any kind of anything that has any kind of sugar even healthy natural sugars your pancreas releases insulin And that opens the gate and lets the sugar into your cells from the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So if you have a prolonged period of time where you don't ingest any sugar molecules, um, your pancreas has a really nice chance to sort of rest and reset, like we talked about, a resetting of your dopamine receptors. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a more effective um, organ, and you have less insulin resistance or trouble getting sugar in the cell or Mm pre-diabetic states, and it can increase your metabolism and help with weight loss. And so there is a trend of intermittent fasting going around where people are just not, not really changing the quality or the type of food they're eating, but just you know, I don't eat after 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. and then I don't eat again till 9 a.m. Mm-hmm. You know, so they have a really prolonged period of fasting and that helps them control their weight. And it does mm-hmm. work for right. that reason, for the for the pancreas resting reason. So with BLE, we don't eat snacks, right? So the plan is um, no sugar, no flour, mm-hmm. no snacks, mm-hmm. and you weigh and measure your food. Those so three the, meals a day is what you yeah, mean. So, and some mm-hmm. people do two meals a day on BLE and some people do more. Yeah. People that are pregnant sometimes do four meals a day or yeah. there's mm-hmm. other medical reasons why people might. But in general, there's a controlled amount of prescribed meal times where mm-hmm. the food is weighed and measured. And between those meal times, we don't eat snacks at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, Susan Pierce Thompson says no one ever died waiting to the next you know, starvation, mm-hmm. waiting till the next meal, mm-hmm. right? So that's part of the a big part of the plan is you eat your meals that you've you, you've set for yourself, however many of those are, and there's no snacking. So after dinner, you know, if you eat dinner at five o'clock. And you don't eat breakfast again till seven o'clock. You just fasted for fourteen hours. Right. So essentially, because there's no snacking, and let's face it, for most of us, I don't know, for me, nighttime oh. snacking was the worst. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I'd eat dinner at five or six, and then I'd be snacking, and Eight, snacking, and nine, snacking, ten. right, right up yeah. until bedtime. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, just by virtue of being on a plan where you don't don't eat snacks and you're just not eating after dinner. Um, you're essentially, in addition to what you're doing uh, with the food in other ways, you're also intermittent, inter- doing intermittent fasting. So it's right. really good for your pancreas. It's one of the reasons that your blood sugar got under control so quickly. Right. Yeah. And also, um, I think like, you know, grain is in, you know, for in, when you're in weight loss, grain is in the morning. Yes. And then mm-hmm. fruit is in the morning and at lunchtime. And so you're also putting anything that's like yes. carb, right. a little carb more carb heavy. Not that vegetables don't have carbs in them because they do. And right. that's fine because we mm-hmm. eat carbs on this. It's not mm-hmm. carbs are not counted on this um on this plan program um but i w- you know i, I do want to yeah. talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit yeah in addition down. to not eating after dinner exactly right. as your yeah your fruits are loaded to the earlier in the day yeah. Yeah. and grain in the, and grain. In yeah. the right. morning so that also yeah do, it, you know it rests the pancreas right exactly so um it's really i mean i think to me it's like really interesting that there is so much science behind BLE and it is not mm-hmm. more widely accepted in, and it's, in the scientific and community. it's the only plan I've ever seen where the science isn't leading you to buy a product. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And it's, and this you is, know what I mean? I mean, that's no, the thing. hundred yeah. percent. And this, this is what I always tell people. It's like, this is not a multi, multi-level marketing no. scheme. Like this is not anything like, it's like literally check the book out from yeah. the library. I yep. am not telling you to buy a gosh darn thing. You yeah. do not have to be a member. You do not even have to buy the book. But I think reading the book is important because it gives you the understanding of the science behind why, right. why this makes sense, why this works, why are, why if you're, especially if you're a food addict and high on the susceptibility scale, why this is not possible with moderation. Like yeah. moderation is not the answer for people yeah. who are high on the susceptibility scale. They mm-hmm. can't say, I'm just going to have a piece of cake once a year. Like people who are food addicts can't do that. Mm-hmm. They just don't have the ability to say no. 
Yep. So any other thoughts? No? Okay. Well, that is our Dr. Bonnie uh, episode, AKA the science mm-hmm. episode about why uh, BLE is really, um, really makes sense. And uh, the science points us in that direction. So thanks for joining and we will talk to you all next time.